one thing to have it in law, it's another thing for you to actually be able to do it. Tonight, questions for the minister on the bill that could make thousands more Indians under the Indian Act. About keeping people safe, people who are normally not, you know, used to being in the city. We check in with fire evacuees staying in a city not known for its friendliness to Indigenous peoples. Marijuana is not killing. Booze and the liquor store is killing. And Nunavut prepares for Canada's new law on legal marijuana. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. After three years of work, a provincial commission has submitted its report to the Quebec National Assembly. The commission's job was to examine the living conditions of Indigenous women in Quebec in relation to domestic violence and sexual assault. Danielle Rochette has more on the story. Manon Massé is a member of Quebec's national parliament. She was also part of the commission assigned to visit Inuit and First Nation communities. She said that she was very surprised to see the living conditions many of the people in those communities have to endure. J'ai vu uh, la pauvreté, j'ai vu l'extrême pauvreté, j'ai vu mais des gens toujours debout, toujours fiers, des gens qui ont envie de prendre soin les uns des autres. Moi, je pense que les députés qui ont été sur les communautés plus jamais vont voir les choses pareilles. Five recommendations came out of the 55-page report. From educational programs on indigenous history to housing, creation of shelters, healing centers, and training for all workers in the milieu. Ce qu'il y a dans ce rapport-là, pour moi, c'est les choses urgentes qui doivent être faites pour assurer aux femmes autochtones qu'elles puissent vivre de façon en sécurité euh, et qu'elles puissent sentir qu'on ne les abandonne pas. Friendship Center worker Tania Serrois says her group was working on some of the report's recommendations years ago, but she says a lot more needs to be done. C'est vraiment l'action gouvernementale. C'est-à-dire que quand même qu'il y a des ministères qui, dossier par dossier, veulent faire en toute bonne volonté, faire avancer le dossier, tant qu'il n'y aura pas une stratégie qui descend du gouvernement et qui est intersectorielle, Je pense qu'on y arrivera peut-être jamais. Massé aussi admit qu'il y a une plus picture behind violence against women. La discrimination, le racisme que vivent les Premières Nations, c'est systémique. Alors, il faut s'attaquer au système et, comme vous le dites, en, en matière de logement, d'emploi, de santé, euh, de vie en, en communauté, de, 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 de protection civile, il faut revoir les façons de faire parce que ça ne marche pas. Despite the fear of another report collecting dust on the shelf, Sirwa still says there's still hope. Au moins, si ce rapport-là peut servir de faire une, une éducation populaire auprès des gens qui travaillent auprès des Autochtones ou des influenceurs au niveau euh, des politiques publiques, donc ça, le rapport aurait tout de moins cette utilité-là. Daniel Rochette, EPTN National News, Montréal. This week, the Alberta government apologized for their part in the 60 scoop where kids were scooped up to be adopted or put into foster homes. APTN's Chris Stewart talked to a recently reunited father and daughter to hear their thoughts on if saying sorry is enough. Opigawasawin. Uh, what? Opigawasawin. 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 Laura Osgood is trying to reconnect with her language and culture. At eight months old, she was put into the Alberta foster system. Her father, Lloyd, was in prison at the time. When he was released, he found a job and had a home for Laura. He says he was ready to have her back. But social services did not return his daughter. Instead, Laura spent the next 18 years of her life in foster families or foster homes. She finally connected with her family in 2016. I missed out on family. Growing up with siblings, parents, um, culture, language, heritage, love. Laura was part of the 60 Scoop, where thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families and put into foster care here and abroad. This week, the Alberta government apologized for their role in the 60 Scoop. Osgood watched the apology from Premier Rachel Notley on television. Alberta was the worst. 
for taking these these children. It's some of them don't even know that they're from here. They're they're down there wondering. I mean, if I if I'm doing it, I'm not the only one. You know, and for an apology, that's that's words, right? You need action, more action. They took so much away from her. They could have had a chance to give to me to to raise her, eh? But the the government didn't do that. Which it was ridiculous. They knew where I was and they knew where my family was from me, but they never did that. Osgood says Alberta needs to help those children who are now adults find their birth parents and cut the red tape with government. She is still waiting for her treaty status. She applied nearly two years ago. Her father doesn't think this apology is enough for Laura. To me, it's, I don't know, it may be enough, but to her it's not. I wouldn't think so because she's lost so much of her life, eh? These are all the time Lord Osgood to... did not quit finding his daughter. He sent out letters to adoption agencies. Uh, then, in 2016, he found right what he was looking for, a match. I never give up hope on her. Like, I always had that feeling that I'd, uh, she's still alive in the round. Today, Osgood is back with her father and her siblings. She says she instantly felt a connection when she saw her dad for the first time in 40 years, yes. two years ago. From them, I was home. I, this, this is where I belonged, and knowing and just touching his face and saying, oh my God, you know, you look like me, you're mine, you're mine. Laura lost a chance to see her mother. She died of cancer just four months before finding her dad. She does have the chance to spend time with her father and to reconnect with her family and her culture she had lost. Chris Stewart, APTN National News. Bonneville, Alberta. Second one, yeah. A bill that received royal assent last December was the topic of discussion at a standing Senate committee on Aboriginal peoples. The Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations gave an update on Bill S3. Here's Annette Francis with more. Minister Bennett began the meeting with a quick overview of what's been happening since Bill S3 received royal assent last year. It was meant to remove all sex-based discrimination from the Indian Act when it comes to registration, but it doesn't eliminate all discrimination. We have now established an Indigenous advisory panel which is providing advice and guidance to the government and will continue to do so throughout the consultation process. The Indigenous advisory panel consists of one member selected by each of the three national Indigenous organizations who represent individuals or partners impacted by Indian Act registration and citizenship provisions. These include the Assembly of First Nations, the Native Women's Association of Canada, and the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. She we says part of the department's obligation under Bill S-3 was plan on a series of consultations to talk about other areas of the Indian Act that need changing and meet with people who have a number of experiences under the Act. As we looked at the 60s scoop, as we look at adoption, we look at people who had rights that were taken away, that it's important that we get this right. Uh, and, that, uh, and that's really what the engagement is about, is to make sure that people understand that even if they were taken from their families, uh, that, that, that this is how we are obligated to be able to allow them the right to go, get back in, in touch with their roots. And Another so issue the engagement so process will look at are the resources needed. Uh, that was the concern about the coming into force was that that we actually had to had to know what it would take to do this properly and to make sure the resources are in place. And so it's one thing to have it in law, it's another thing for you to actually be able to do it. And so we want to be able to do this properly and we're going to put every effort to make sure that happens. According to Bennett, 7,000 applications have been received since the passage of Bill S-3. The consultations with communities, organizations and individuals will begin in June. Anna Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. It's good news for communities in northern Manitoba, particularly Churchill, as a deal appears on the horizon to get the rail line up and running. More on that after the break, but first, here's a look at tonight's season finale of Nation to Nation. 
final show of the season. And we zero in on child welfare. It's well known more kids are in care than at the height of the residential school system. We'll show you a pair of mothers who refused to give their consent and kept their children out of the system. Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott will be by to discuss what her government is doing to improve that system. That's immediately following the national news. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Another scorcher in Fredericton, 31 under the sun, 7 in St. John's. A rainy high of 16 for Happy Valley Goose Bay, rain and 3 above in Nain. Rain and 12 in Septiel, 16 in Shibugamu, 23 in Saguenay, 18 in Sarnia and North Bay, a rainy high of 25 in Ottawa, 14 for Sudbury, Timmins and Sioux Lookout. In Manitoba, rain and 13 in Flinflon, rain and 10 in the Paw. Rain and 16 in Gimli Harbor and Brandon, 17 with rain in Winnipeg. That rain continues in parts of Saskatchewan, 16 in Swift Current, 15 in Regina. Sunny skies and 17 in Stony Rapids, 16 under the sun in Uranium City. Welcome back. It's been a week since the people of Little Grand Rapids First Nation were airlifted to Winnipeg after severe fires threatened the area 280 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg. Community leaders are working with the province and the federal government to ensure evacuees return home safely. But as Brittany Hobson shows us, some of the evacuees are more worried about the risks of staying in the city. A week ago, Teresa Aishan sat with dozens of people in this school gym, worried and waiting to be airlifted out of Little Grand Rapids. Severe fires forced an emergency evacuation. Now, Aishan is upset about the community she left behind. We're thinking about home. We want to, we're hoping that we still have a community, you know, to go back to because we heard there's other fires that have sprung up because of the lightning. Provincial authorities said Wednesday that three homes are destroyed. Recent footage shows most of the billowing smoke is gone, but the damage remains. Colin Mikas was part of a crew who went back to Little Grand Rapids last weekend. It looked too bad from the air, like it was still green, like where, where we live anyway, on the north side. But on the south side is black where the houses burned down. Another crew heads up there this week to begin the rebuilding efforts. Chief and Council expect it could be another month before evacuees can return home due to damaged power lines. While evacuees worried about spoiled food and pets left behind, some are concerned about the challenges they may face in the city. One thing that we need to look at too is um, that all those uh, elements that are available easily in the city, I'm talking about drugs and stuff like that, they're easy access and stuff and we don't want our young people to even experiment on anything like that. So the sooner we get them out of the city, the better it'll be. Some say that they, they find used needles and stuff, like they have little ones that, that they, they take outside. Either way, there's, you know, it's dangerous, dangerous still, even though we're in Winnipeg. Aishan says the community has banded together. It's about keeping people safe, people who are normally not you know, used to being in the city, you know, they think, you know, it's not the same as being on in a small community. They have to be, you know, we have to be vigilant and keep an eye on each other. 820 Little Grand Rapid residents were evacuated. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News, Winnipeg. Still in Manitoba, the federal government has announced a tentative deal is in the works to restore railway service to the north. The announcement comes more than a year after the rail line to Churchill was washed out, disrupting services. Two groups representing Northern and First Nation communities have joined together with the Toronto Group to purchase the rail line from Denver-based group Omnitrax. Severe flooding washed out portions of the tracks in May 2017. Omnitrax has previously said they would not pay for the repairs, which came with a price tag of roughly $40 million. Churchill mayor and co-chair of one of the groups purchasing the rail line calls the deal a milestone. We've got an agreement in principle 
We're working towards finalizing the deal. Priority one here is to get the line up and running. Um, and we see an opportunity for prosperity here. It's going to change um, how this region is going to be looked upon. Nunavut is one of the last jurisdictions in Canada to prepare for the upcoming legalization of marijuana. Now the Legislative Assembly is considering a bill to make legalization a reality. But as our Kent Driscoll reports, Nunavut's legislation is unique. This from Iqaluit. This is Nunavut's new drug dealer. Or it will be once Bill 7 passes. Nunavut's Legislative Assembly has tabled marijuana legislation with some of the most restrictive rules in the country. No growing plants allowed, no retail sales at least to begin with, and all orders will be handled online and mailed out. The residents we talk to approve. Um, it's definitely a good idea because then the kids won't be able to get to it as easily. Well, it's a good idea really, to believe it or not. I'm, an, uh, I'm a recovered alcoholic and addict, and um, I think marijuana is way better than booze, way better than liquor store. Marijuana is not killing. Booze and the liquor store is killing. I do think that's a good idea in a lot of ways, mostly for break-in reasons. As some people may know, the, uh, over the years, whenever uh, liquor orders would come in through the ship, a lot of the younger ones tend to go towards those containers and, you know, they do what they want. To order online requires a credit card. On the surface, that would seem to discriminate against poor people, forcing them to black market offerings. Not so, according to these Nunavut mute. Even the poorest Nunavut residents have figured out how to get around those barriers by now. Everyone's got a wee visa or an online type of card nowadays, which is really beneficial. As there are always backups, like um, credit cards you can buy over at the store, right? Prepaid credit cards. Nunavut's liquor laws have dry and wet communities. The proposed marijuana legislation doesn't. Every town in Nunavut will be a green one. Bill 7 is awaiting debate at the Nunavut Legislative Assembly, and that debate will decide the future of marijuana for the territory. Kent Driscoll, ABTN National News, Iqaluit. Meanwhile, the Senate will not act on recommendations to be Bill C-45, the cannabis law, to delay its implementation for one year. That was a recommended amendment by the Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples. As many individuals and groups have complained about a lack of consultation. At a press conference this week, a trio of senators talked about the examination of C-45, but holding it up for more consultations with Indigenous communities was not on the table. When specific to a one-year delay that were put before the committee last night, there was a Conservative amendment that would have had the effect of delaying uh, the implementation of the bill. Uh, ISG senators who were on social affairs decided that that was not appropriate for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it would actually jeopardize, they felt, jeopardize the health of First Nations communities who would not have access to the programs that would be in place as soon as the bill goes into effect. The Zawadeno First Nation of King Kong Inlet in British Columbia is taking their fight against salmon farms to BC's highest court. The claim is the first of its kind to extend Aboriginal title to the ocean. The nation filed a claim of Aboriginal title that affects 10 fish farms in their traditional territory and say they are operating without consent. Although the case could take years to go through the courts, the nation is putting more pressure on the new NDP government to end fish farm tenures which are up for renewal in three weeks. It goes back to 30 years ago when they first started to come into our territory. We've always, always said no, and they just, they plunk themselves in our territory anyways. You just see time and time again, like we try it their way, we've tried it the nice way, that we tried it the polite way, but they're never ever gonna listen. So this is why we're going for title. Then they'll have to, they'll have to listen to us. Time for another quick break, but you'll want to stick around. We've got an inspiring story of a Regina landscaper.
Here's the rest of Friday's weather outlook. Picking back up in northern Alberta, 16 in Peace River, Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. Cooler day in Red Deer and Calgary with a high of 11, 12 in Medicine Hat. A wet day on the west coast as well, 12 in Port Hardy, 13 in Tofino, 14 in Campbell River, 12 in Sandspit, Prince Rupert, Smithers and Deese Lake. In the Yukon, 18 in Old Crow and Dawson City. Some of the highest temps on Friday are in the NWT. 20 in Fort Liard and Norman Wells, 21 in Wrigley. 19 in Fort McPherson, a high of just two above for Saks Harbor. In Nunavut, plus five in Arviette. Welcome back. Yard work isn't easy. It takes time and effort. But as CTV Regina's Joss Diaz reports, that doesn't scare off a man whose approach to lawn maintenance is pretty impressive, all things considered. Taking care of the lawn may seem like a chore, but for Howard Desjardins, it keeps him busy. I got a lot of work all week here and there, just like little small jobs. Desjardins spends his time selling his landscaping services to homeowners in Regina to make money as he searches for employment. I do it for myself and my kids. I just make enough to spend on them. Along with help from his mother, Nettie Cusance, he's been able to reach over a dozen lawns per week, a feat that she says makes her very proud. Watching him do go out and work and but not, it's, it's like he's still got his legs there. Desjardins is missing both of his legs from the knee down after two separate accidents required them to be amputated. Losing one leg at 19 and the other at 28, Desjardins has definitely faced an uphill battle. That being said, at 36, he says his situation is not going to stop him. Some of them say, how can you do that? Huh? I don't know, just do it, I guess. <laughs> Desjardins says while new customers are often a bit shocked at first, his work speaks for itself. And as his business continues to grow, he's already planning on expanding. I'm looking forward to saving up money for uh, a scooter. I want to get a new scooter so I can get around faster, put a trailer on it, put, a, put the lawnmower and everything on that. I think he's a very good role model. For his little girls, his little girls are 12 and 13 now, and she's very good. But he better finish up my yard <laughs> before he leaves today. And although the work might not be easy, to Desjardins, finishing the job means more than just a nice lawn. It's all fun anyways. I like, I like, I like it. I don't like letting my legs take me down. Let me take me down from what I want to do. Josh Diaz, CTV News. Regina. What an inspiration Howard is. That's an incredible story. And that's your APTN National News for this Thursday. There's so much more over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Don't turn that dial. Todd Lamarand is next with the season finale of Nation to Nation. Dennis Ward, have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.